welcome to the latest Sport in Lunchtime Lecture here at the Record Cafe. If you're not here for the Sport in Lunchtime Lecture, well, you're going to be educated whether you like it or not. <laughs> so really, um, I've been looking forward to this talk for some considerable time since we set it up, because we've got, from the women's, uh, the, the pioneering days of women's football in the 1920s, there were two teams who were really, really at the forefront. One was Dick Kerr's ladies from Preston who became the de facto England team, one of the best teams in the world, well, probably the best team in the world. But a team from Bradford did give them a run for the money. They were probably, well, we'll say they were the second best team, shall we? <laughs> They're the second best team, women's team in the 1920s. And that was Hayes Ladies Brewery from up uh, Long Lane. And our speakers today represent both of those two teams because we've got Steve Bolton, who's come all the way from Essex to talk to us today. Well done, Steve. <laughs> Steve stayed overnight, by the way, he stayed for two nights in, in Bradford, and, and given that he walks at me at 2 a.m. this morning, I rather suspect he's been enjoying the, the night economy of Bradford. Well done, Steve. He's been pumping money into our economy, that's what we need. So Steve's gran, granny played for Dick Kerr's ladies. And uh, despite his accent, he's really a, a Lancastrian. Um, you'll forgive him for both of those things. <laughs> And also here today is a well-known a well known face in the record cafe, uh, Catherine Hare, of course is there. She's a bit nervous to be, uh, be gentle with her today. Um, Catherine, of course, is a, a, a direct descendant of the Hayes Brewing Company, whose uh, ladies played an awful lot of football. And as you'll find out, because I'm going to stand, you've not got rid of me completely, I'm going to give you five minutes on women's cricket in 1930s Bradford, which guess what Hayes are involved in. So without further ado, I'll pass you along to Steve. Hello. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention Malcolm. It's all right. I'll, I'll oh, don't worry about that. Um, I, this is, uh, uh, forgive me, I might get a bit emotional because we've got a very uh, special guest uh, today, uh, Malcolm, and I will introduce him uh, in a few slides in. Um, I've been looking forward to meeting Malcolm for, for the longest time. So, let's get cracking. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, my name is Steve Bolton, and I have this famous granny. Um, you notice on my T-shirt, uh, she's the tall one there. There's the famous Lily Parr. This this was uh, picture was taken at Hernhill Hill Velodrome in 1925, because of course the women were banned by the English FA. Um, there's film clips of this, and that morning she was a uh, guest of the Houses of Parliament, guest of the Lord Mayor of London. Uh, I knew none of this as a young man. I just had this grizzled old lady as a granny who I, I, I knew played a bit of football. That was about it, really. <clears throat> so I've been on quite a journey over the last several years. And on the back of my T-shirt, you've got um, the, the two world champion postcards, and my granny's on both of them. Again, I knew none of this. Um, and I don't normally wear pictures of my granny on my T-shirt. I know that's not normal, so this will be going off uh, after today. Uh, so, um, just very briefly, Dave, we've got that slightly wrong. Uh, Hayes are the third best team because the second best team was actually uh, St. Helens. And there's my granny's debut medal. Very, very valuable, unique and rare from April the 20th, 1921. That was her debut for St. Helens uh, in front of 30,000 at St. Andrews, Birmingham City's football ground, age 16. 1921, 16 years old, woman, 30,000. Yeah. Um, that's at the English National Football Museum. I found that in a box of old tut in uh, my uncle's garage loft several years ago, and that, that sort of started me off really on the journey. So the go-to team for the famous, world famous Dicko ladies, 1917 to 1965, in the early days, post-World War I, was St. Helens. The next one after the ban, when St. Helens really folded, was Hayes Brewery. So Hayes Brewery were a magnificent team, and you'll see a bit of that on the slides. Um, and these are some of our other medals. Uh, 1933 for playing against the French, 1934 for playing against the Belgian national side, and 1931, that turned up, that's not mine, uh, somebody contacted me a year ago, said, uh, I think I'm a distant relative, I have a silver medal with your granny's name on, and that was a famous game at the Vetch in uh, Swansea City's football ground in 1931 in front of 7,000. 
So, um, quite a legacy. I'm, I'm a lucky guy. Um, yeah, and that's the that's the photo I've got on my on my T-shirt. That's an original Daily Mirror press photo from 1925, and I picked that up at an auction. And I'm not going to say how much that costs, just in case my wife gets to <laughs> listen to this. Uh, so, brief history timeline. So, th this is from the British Newspaper Archive, and it's just uh, a, a sort of rough look at articles mentioning women's football. And you can see, First World War, there are the spikes. 1919, women's football almost disappears. And then 1920-21, it goes absolutely bananas. And then towards the end of the 21, uh, December the 5th, you get the FA ban, and it, it tails off, and women's football gets very difficult. Um, so, just some key dates. You've got the Victorian era, you've got a couple of tours there. The, all that really happened for promoting women's football then was it, it entrenched in thousands and thousands of articles that women's football was the most ridiculous idea. Um, but that would be 99.9% .9 of the population, <coughs> male and female. Uh, so much so that when a little tour was proposed in 1902, the English FA banned women's football. Not much is said about that, but that ban was never repealed. Then you, you got a global war, and that changed society to the extent where women's football became acceptable. And, and over a thousand games were played, raising vast amounts of charity, absolutely vast amounts. And I had the great honour this year of being invited to lay a wreath at the Cenotaph in London on behalf of the women footballers of World War I. It's very emotional. Um, 1920 to 21, we have an absolutely broken country. We, we've got uh, people starving on, on, on the, in our major cities. It, 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 if you're a man and you're unemployed, it was so humiliating, sometimes they wouldn't accept or ask for charity help, and, and families actually starved. So again, the huge ability of the women to raise money uh, was, uh, the women stepped forward and, and played a beautiful game, but also actually saved lives. Then you've got what I call the banned season. So although the flagship, if you like the flagship's the wrong word, the, the notorious date is December the 5th, women's football had effectively been banned before that. Word had gone out, and you find very few games, and about the only team that was allowed to play up till that ban in that season was the Dick Curl ladies. This is one of the amazing things about Hayes Brewery. That's when Hayes Brewery started, yet they managed 20 games in that band season, which is an incredible amount. The, the uh, Dick Curl ladies played more, but the only other game, uh, team that I know of is Stoke, and they only managed 12 games in that season, so Hayes, Hayes did very, very well. Right. So, I, I found this a few years ago, and I just thought I'd put this slide in just to show you, okay. So these are ordinary working class girls from a bottling plant in Bradford. And here they are shown, this could have been on Valley Parade, and they're uh, uh, featured in the San Francisco Chronicle. They, that's how, you know, that's how famous and well thought of they were. Um, one of the key things about us all gathering today here is that our friendship through football and uh, that's very true here with my, my great friend Catherine. Um, we were, um, we've actually been guests twice at Hampden with the Scottish National Football Museum because of uh, a famous Scottish team that um, the Dick Curl ladies lost to, but Hayes beat, actually. Um, so, uh, 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 it, you know, we've had some lovely times. And uh, I ended up uh, quite by accident with two VIP tickets to the Euros final at Wembley. Um, my wife isn't into football, neither of my sons, and I thought, who might want the other ticket? <laughs> so, uh, talking about uh, bite my hand off, so we, we had a, a, the loveliest time. So, I think it's time for me to stop talking and hand over to somebody from Bradford. all for coming i've been looking forward to this event for so long i really have i'm a little bit nervous never done this before never had a microphone in my hand so forgive me i'm sure you'll you'll step in when necessary um just wanted to sort of um start off i'm not going to bore you to death with all the details of the brewery but i just thought it was quite important just to kind of introduce you to you know some of the ancestors here 
Uh, we've obviously got Arthur Hay here that was very uh, encouraging of the girls playing football. Um, I'm in touch with his grandson over in Canada. Um, next to him is one of Joseph Hay's um, sons, Herbert Hay, who was also on the board of directors and um, had a big part to play at Bradford City. It was about sort of during the 1911 Cup final. And then we've got last in line Walter Hay, who also was very supportive of the ladies' football team. And we know that it was, I think we've got Malcolm down there, well, he did definitely support Bradford City. So yes, we'll, uh, we'll include him as well. So yes, um, I'll just read a few notes. So yeah, so um, Joseph Hay, um, oh, we're just gonna go to the next slide now. Okay. So yeah, we've actually got some very rare pictures. We've actually found some um, pictures of the man himself, Joseph Hay, which have just come to light this last sort of few months. So fabulous to have those. So actually off another family tree. Um, I'm in touch with two or three of uh, Joseph Hay's grandchildren, which are absolutely, you know, keep asking me, when can we have some more beer? So maybe that could be the next, uh, the next thing we do. Uh, so yeah, I found these wonderful pictures. Uh, that's Joseph Hay um, and Mary Lancaster. Joseph Hay was born at Deanfield Farm up near Stanbury um, in 1849. Uh, members of the Hay family lived at Deanfield Farm. My great grandfather was born there, and several members of the Hay family were all born there uh, over a course of a hundred years. Um, and he married Mary Lancaster, that was um, actually from the I and G Lancaster family. Uh, a few of you might have heard of, you know, the uh, wool merchants that were down Cheapside. Uh, also related to Arthur Lancaster, which I'm sure most of you will will know. So this was a later photograph of um, Joseph with his horses outside Maple Hill, his sort of final home. He did sort of obviously have quite a lot of addresses in and around Bradford. He did sort of live up Willow Street initially when he was sort of single, but when he married, um, got the brewery running in, in 1874, he, um, he, he sort of lived up at Maple Hill, which Park Road on Manningham. So yes, so, yeah, so we'll move on to the next slide, please, Steve. So... So yes, th this one, I was thinking it was Joseph Hay. It's come out of the family um, box, but we're a bit unsure as to whether it is him. It probably is him, uh, because we know the Hay family love the cars. It sort of makes sense it, it was him, but, it, but this has been kindly supplied to me by um, <coughs> one of the Hay relatives. Probably just out on a, a day trip to the Dales or something. I'm not quite sure where it is, but it uh, looks, looks nice anyway. So yes, so Joseph Hay and his uncle William, like I say, was, they came from Oakworth, um, up near Stanbury. Um, Joseph initially worked as a carpenter and joiner, and William had been employed as a mechanic in Worsted Mills. They both moved to Bradford during the Industrial Revolution. In 1874, they commenced a new business venture, which was its ale and porter merchants and bottlers. In 1890, William retired, and the following year, Joseph entered the brewing trade. The business was formed into a limited company, and in 1898, the founding family members remained in control. Um, as some of you know, they were, had a great reputation for producing excellent draft and bottled beers. Um, the Brewers Exhibition in 1920, they won the Championship Gold Cup for Best Beer in a Bottle. This was the first time the company had entered a, a, a beer for competition. The Pale Ale, which after a time was renamed Gold Cup, which became the Brewery's flagship brand. So, quite a few of you will recognise um, these four pubs. Uh, one of 75 pubs in and around um, Bradford, Yorkshire, and and beyond. I've just sort of picked out four for you here because sort of all central to Bradford. So we've got obviously the Old Fleece, which was just a stone's throw. Um, across on Stone Street, um, most of us, um, well, I can just vaguely remember having a drink there, obviously when it was a Webster's pub. Uh, but yeah, very, very popular pub, one of the last um, pubs actually, I think, to be built. Um, so yeah, there we are. We've obviously got the old um, Hagies, uh, the Flying Dutchman on Lund Lane, which obviously a lot of us um, used to go to back in the sort of 80s and 90s. So yeah, that was originally an ounce of Hayes. 
Um, and then we've got the, the flagship pub, The Queen's, that was just right next to the brewery, um, up on Lund Lane. And finally, we've got the Rawson Hotel, which of course many of you will know. And that's quite significant in this because um, when the French girls came across to play uh, Hayes Ladies in 1922, the French ladies were actually pictured on the steps of the Rawson Hotel. So, you know, the, uh, and I think they did actually stay there. So, yeah, it is quite, you know, of, of uh, quite significance. So, does anybody recognise where this, this was taken? This photograph here. Anybody recognise the ground? Gosh. And we're all going today. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, this was taken at Valley Parade, and this is one of the first pictures I've actually got of the Hayes Ladies actually pictured at Valley Parade, so I was really excited to see this one. This was actually the original team. The team had significantly changed by 1923, 1924, but this was the original team um, in 1920, 21. Um, I believe they had the first match actually in April in 1921 against Lister's Ladies up at um, Peel Park. But we do know the Hayes ladies did play and trained at Valley Parade quite regularly. So yes, how many of you have been on the turf at Valley Parade? <laughs> Not recently, anyway. Yeah. Not, Not legally. Not legally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dear. Steve, shall I uh, pass you over for a... Okay. Hello. Um, yeah, the other uh, thing that we thought we'd mention was um, the, the, after the uh, infamous 1921 FA ban, another little known fact is that the um, Northern Union, uh, the, the sort of founding uh, uh, people of the uh, Rugby League, uh, decided to join in the ban and uh, they banned uh, Women's Association football from their grounds. I'm, I'm glad to say they, they, they didn't continue it in the 30s, but certainly in 22 they made it difficult. Um, I think a key thing that um, uh, uh, I would bring to the table here to, to you Bradfordians is, is just how important this team was. The, these women were international footballers uh, back in the day. Uh, the, the, when Olympic de Paris uh, toured in 1922, they played um, five games, four of against the, uh, the Dicker ladies but Hayes were afforded a game as well. And uh, they were a good side, very good side, and Hayes beat them 2-0. As I mentioned earlier, they went all the way up to Scotland, beat the great Scottish team, the legendary Scottish team, the Rutherglen ladies, 3-0. Um, uh, and uh, Jenny Harris. Now, if you do do a little bit about women's football history, you'll probably hear about Lily Parr. I write a lot about Lily Parr, she was my Granny's best mate, a lot of nonsense on the internet about it. What is not made clear quite often is that uh, when she joined the Dick Curl Lady, she was only a young girl, she was uh, left back. The star players were Florrie Redford and Jenny Harris up front. And according to the Lancashire newspapers, the best player in Lancashire by a country mile was Jenny Harris. She was uh, poached from Lancaster by uh, um, Alfred Franklin because Lancaster beat the Dick Curl ladies a couple of times with this star player, Jenny Harris, and she formed a formidable partnership up front with Florrie Redford. Um, so she really was one of the superstars of women's football. Uh, we think in a 1923, she got a job with uh, English Electric, uh, who owned the Dick Curl factory, but also had a factory in Bradford and she moved to the Bradford branch, so she joined her friends Hayes Ladies. So, uh, in 1923, and, and I think this is the single most achievement uh, of, the, uh, of the Dick Curl Ladies, there was this massive renaissance French scene of women's football in the 20s. Um, I have a, a, an A4 book at home by a researcher called Helga Fowler of the 23-24 season. It's close type going through all the games, and it's over 100 pages deep. There were 25 teams in and around Paris. Um, so Hayes went over in 1923, and at uh, uh, Star Pershing, they beat the French national side 1-0, which is quite an achievement for a, you know, a bunch of bottling girls from, from, from Bradford. Hey. Hey. So uh, this is the uh, Rawson Hotel, and there, 
There they are. Uh, the French side pictured uh, on the steps of the Rawson Hotel. We managed to find a, a newspaper article about that. And um, I have to mention this this uh, this woman. Uh, does anybody know who this is? Right. Okay. Well, you, you, when you look back at all this history, you, you you come across some amazing women who had amazing lives, and like Lily Barr's life was fascinating. All, all these fantastic women footballers. They pale into insignificance compared to the life and the controversy of Violette Gourard Morris. So um, she was an incredibly powerful woman. She was a, a world shot put champion. She was captain of Olympic de Paris. She was a tremendous footballer. Um, she was dressed as a man, uh, smoked. Um, it caused controversy wherever she went, really. She was a hero of the First World War. She was a racing driver. Um, unfortunately, in the Second World War, um, she, um, she sided with the Vichy French and the Nazis, and uh, she was executed by the Maquis. And uh, again, you'll read, if you read some stuff about her, especially the hyena of the Gestapo, as she was known, that's felt not to be true now, because there, there, there'd been some proper research on her life. What happened was she was a... a uh, a driver for uh, a guy who was a, uh, alleged to be a collaborator and he and his wife and two young children were in the car and uh, they were ambushed by the Maquis with the machine guns and they just pumped it full of bullets and, and murdered everybody in the car. So it's felt that some of, uh, uh, some of the stories about her, and they are awful, I'm not even going to say them here, uh, the, the torture she took part in, that's, we, we don't think is true. But, um, yeah, by a country mile, this is an interesting person, uh, and uh, I'm kind of relieved my, uh, my, 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 my granny didn't play against her. Um, the, uh, oh, and the other thing to mention was, she, um, she lived quite a, a licentious life on, the, on a houseboat in uh, Paris, so they'd have wild parties and drugs and all this sort of thing, and she was actually uh, almost put on trial for murder. Uh, uh, a guy was shot dead on her boat, and she, you know, um, she claimed self-defence. So, uh, you, 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 I could do a whole lecture on, on Violette Gerard Morris. And unfortunately, there's no English book about her life. There's, the book's in French, but uh, when the translation comes through, I'm, I'm definitely going to read that. And, you know, she was very well thought of back in 1922. There she is, laying a wreath at the cenotaph. So, um, uh, yeah, that's Violette. Yes, 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 she was captain of the team that uh, uh, Bradford beat. That was her on the steps of the Rawson Hotel. Um, this is the uh, this is this is the team. This is the reason we were uh, Catherine and I were invited to Hamden. There's a, a, a travelling exhibition of women's uh, football uh, uh, in, uh, going around Scotland. It's been to the Scottish Parliament and it's going to go, go back to the Scottish Football Museum about the Rutherglen ladies. And these uh, this is the team that beat my granny's team in 1923. But Hayes, the year before, went up and put them to the sword 3-0. So uh, um, they didn't mention that game. They spent the next 10 years mentioning the game where they've beaten the Dick Hill ladies. So, uh, um, and I think what's really interesting is uh, um, when you sort of talk about the ban and the, the accusation that the FA made that football wasn't suitable for women, what, what's missed out in the argument is the physicality of the women. And you see how tiny they are. And look at the goals. So you can see with Lily Parr with a powerful kick, all she'd have to do was get you know, near the edge of the box and lob one in, and she'd score, wouldn't she? That women were really, really much smaller back in the day. Right, do you want to... Okay, so this is, uh, this is the great Jenny Harris in, in her Hayes kit, and this is uh, Edith Jackson, who's one of the leading captains of... Uh, of the um, uh, Hayes Brewery, that's thanks to our friend Hilga Fowler. Um, and th I have this original magazine, the Mirror Ad de Sport from 1923, and there's Hayes Brewery uh, 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 featuring in there uh, at Star Pershing beating France 1 0. So, uh, like I say, they, they were pretty, pretty famous. Right, this is you. Yes, another exciting photograph actually. This one has just come to light this last three or four weeks. 
Um, thanks to my fabulous friend, Mick Pendleton, um, we found um, a relative, actually, of um, a new player that's come to light, Mary Burke, which she's just pictured third from the right. Again, another picture at Valley Parade, so even, even more exciting. So again, this was the, not, not the really early team, but the next, the, sort of the, the season after, basically, 1921-22 season. So yeah, what I'm going to just do is just identify, you know, nice to sort of talk about the team, but just pick out, you know, I can't pick them up. I'd love to sort of talk about all of them, basically, because they're all equally as important, but shorter time. So I'll just pick out one or two players. I'll start off with Mary Burke, actually, because she's just come to light this last few weeks. Um, I'm in touch with her grandniece over in Scarborough, um, and she's absolutely delighted, you know, that this, uh, this photograph is being put to some good use, found in a family photograph box of her uncle. Sadly, Mary died when she was only 46, before her grandma was born, so very difficult to get any details, but we do know that her uncle said that she did play football, found this lovely uh, postcard with a lovely handwritten message itself from Mary in the photo box, so that was really nice. So yeah, we think Mary, she would maybe not have been a regular player, but she certainly was a fringe player, and she did appear in um, some of the games you know, in that season, including the one over at Turf Moor, Steve, so... So yes, so um, yeah, born in 1901 in Naresborough, she came to Bradford like a lot of the girls did, presumably to find work. Um, worked definitely at Hayes in the bottling department in 1921 and definitely played in quite a few games in the 1922 stroke 23 season. Okay, next we'll move on to uh, the famous winger, Tiny I. Emerson. Um, Tiny was one of the first names that sort of came to light when I was started doing my research because she was sort of the famous winger of the team. Um, she was known as the Dickie Bond of the team and it was reported in the Bradford Daily Telegraph that Tiny and another player, Lily Bucock, could credit a place in a first division men's side. So that shows the sort of quality of football that these girls were actually playing. Ivy, um, we know she was born in Pontefract. Um, she was actually the daughter of a professional soldier. Um, and we know that she came to Bradford with a family, um, lived up Undercliff, I believe. Uh, might not have got that right, but she, up a Rushton Road, that's it. She lived up, up a Rushton Road. Um, and then she, later on, she formed a friendship with another Hayes player, Annie Stevenson. And those two became joint owners together and had a lifelong friendship living together. Uh, probably until the deaths, um, and they ended up sort of living up Barker End Road. Ivy, I've no evidence of her actually working at Hayes. Um, we know she did appear in the Listers football team initially, and then she started playing for Hayes in 1921 when she actually was a silk twister at Listers Mill. So quite interesting there um, that, um, you know, maybe because Listers folded, you know, she, she decided that she was, well, she was an all, all round sort of sports sports girls, so she probably just, you know, wanted to carry on playing football. So I'll just, um, I, I think, I think it's Tiny I. Emerson on, I can just see Malcolm over there um, in front of me. I think Ivy is the one to the right of the ball on the front, or the one next to her on the right. Um, obviously being, you know, Tiny is one of those two girls, I'm sort of thinking it is that one, because I sort of recognise her from the cricket picture as well, which we'll show you a bit later on. And then I've got to sort of just talk about Mabel Benson a little bit. Um, she's centred in the middle with a ball. Uh, Mabel was the original captain and, and played football originally um, and then moved on to be um, the Hayes goalkeeper from there on. Mabel sort of started with the Hayes ladies and basically finished with them and ended up sort of playing cricket. Um, in 1911, Mabel was living with her parents at Texas Street in Undercliff. And then we know that in 1939 that she was unmarried, living at Lupton Street, number 50, which was right on the end, just basically over the wall from Valley Parade. So no wonder she loved uh, football, we're living so close to Valley Parade. Both her and, and the sister both worked at the brewery, both worked in the bottling department. Um, and both Ivy and Matt Mabel went on to play cricket. So, um, Excellent. Next one. This, this is Mary Burke again, just a sort of nice to sort of see her as they were dressed back in those days, a sort of a, um, a, a nice comparison there. So yes, that's a, that's a, a fantastic picture. I'll, I'll just 
I will just mention um, another player, Mary Borthwick. She was born in Durham. Uh, she lived at Quarry Street. I don't actually have a, foot, a, a picture of her in the football team, but we know that she did play. But the great thing is we have got her featured in the cricket um, picture. So Mary um, played in both matches at Turf Moor in 1923 against Steve's Graham. She was also a fabulous uh, cricketer. And when Hayes didn't have a, a match, she would turn out for Great Horton. So yes, um, I think I'll put um, introduce Mark now. So um, this is a, a um, actually an illustration from the uh, um, Illustrated London News uh, from back in nineteen. This is actually in nineteen twenty four, but it's about a game in nineteen twenty three. There were a pair of games, and they were floodlit, and they played at uh, Turf Moor but on the cricket ground, which is adjacent to the football ground, a bit, a bit like Headingley. Um, and it was really innovative, a uh, floodlit game. The uh, Alfred Franklin used his connections uh, and paid quite a lot of money, and they had the uh, industrial dock lighting uh, from Siemens. So uh, you could basically read a newspaper on the pitch, very innovative, uh, years before men's, the men's game. I'm actually doing a bit of an article about this. Um, and uh, unusually, it's the Dick Kerr ladies who are in the stripes. Um, it's, it's actually Hayes who are in the white. Um, so we've uh, we found a, a, you know, detailed reports of the game. And uh, my granny definitely played in both those games. Lost a lot of money, actually, because uh, uh, it, it was actually played on Boxing Day and on New Year's Eve. And Burnley had its worst weather for years, and horrible snowstorms and all sorts. So the crowds were very low. So it was a bit of a disaster at the end of a disastrous year for the Dick Kerr ladies. Um, but one of the things uh, that's really significant is this game was almost 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago, two months kind of to, to today. So 100 years after this game, and the key thing of what we're talking about here is friendship, is we know for a fact that my granny uh, played for the Dick Kerr ladies in those two games, so she's probably on this picture, and she played against uh, Mary Borthwick, who was one of the key players uh, uh, in that era for uh, Hayes. And so what we've got for you today is a very, very special guest. And I'd like to introduce Mary Borthwick's son, Malcolm. Hello and thank you. Uh, I'm a proud Adfordian, born in Quarry Street in Heaton. Um, to a family where my mother hardly ever swore, and in fact she only swore, I think, twice that I know of. One was when she called a fairly vicious neighbour who had a face like a cat's arse. <laughs> and the second time when she referred to the mean bastard, or the mean bastards, and she was referring to the FA, she suffered the humiliation of, um, of having um, the, the football being banned um, from Valley Parade, and she referred to them from then on as the, as the main bastards. Um, when they said it was not appropriate for women to be playing football, and when the bishop echoed that by saying that it was unseemly for women to be playing football. Um, my dad remembered, my dad was courting her at that time, and remembers it really well. He had a hard time for about a month, with a bit of an anger, a burst of anger, and she got quite tetchy about the whole thing. Um, she only spoke quite a lot to my brother, particularly, about wandering homeless without a pitch, with no, no valley parade to play on, feeling like homeless itinerants, wandering from pitch to pitch, um, Salem and what have you. But they finished up in Greenfield Studio, yeah, Stadium in, in Dudley Hill, uh, and they found a, bit more, a more permanent home there. But the humiliation, I think, from the mother she spoke of was, was, was made worse by the fact that she, along with thousands and thousands and thousands of other women, had stepped into the plate to, for the war effort. Ammunition factories, breweries, um, long distance lorry driving, a whole range of things normally taken up by men. The women in their droves st stepped up to the, uh, to the war effort. And it was as if, having done all that, 
and also provided entertainment for vast armies of people playing football and cricket, particularly football, suddenly, with a shrug of the pen, to be kicked into the heap and, pit, and to be told you're, you're of no real value, really hit home, I think. She was quite angry for a long time. Um, I've got a theory that uh, one of the reasons why the FA did ban was that many of the football players, women's football teams, were playing, um, raising money for, cha for, for charities, but quite a few were raising money for political events, including minor strikes. And I wondered whether the government had a say in trying to um, <coughs> stop that, that from occurring. Um, what it did do to my mother was from being a very quiet, uh, selfish, unassuming woman, she, the dad said, was transformed really into a quite an independent, assertive, strong-minded, strong-willed woman. And I think that was just simply by gaining confidence with other women and showing them that they could move beyond. Because don't forget, at that time, um, the suffragette movement was still in progress. Don't forget, at that time, women had no vote and um, they were fighting a battle um, and football was one of them. And she did, she did work for a while at Lister's Mill in the weaving shed, but she found it so noisy she couldn't cope. And it's then she moved to Hayes Brewery in the 1920s and found that there was a much more, much more amiable spirit there. People could talk and chat. There was no clatter of machines. And it's from there that this incredible team spirit she spoke about, camaraderie, arose and resulting in um, football, football teams. Um, she had a great a lot of regard for Mr. Hay, she called him, uh, Arthur Hay. Uh, she spoke in revered terms about him. And I remember as a child, we often went to the Rawson Hotel for many years for a beef sandwich and a, and a and pop. And I often wondered why the Rawson Hotel was so dear to her heart. And it's only of late that I realised the obvious that, that Arthur Hay, or the Hayes, owned the Rawson Hotel, so she felt some sort of affinity with that particular pub, really. Um, we still don't know, I don't think, and perhaps somebody might have an idea whether Arthur Hay was behind the idea of setting up Hayes Brewery football team, or whether it was the women themselves. Don't forget, Arthur Hay was on the board of management of Bradford City at the time. Um, she never talked to me about playing in France. She talked to my brother Walter, who died a few, two or three years, two or three years ago. Um, Walter thinks that she wasn't particularly enamoured by that because she was only a reserve player in France, and I think she was a bit miffed by that <laughs> element of, um, of demotion. I've only discovered that following discussion with with Catherine Hay. I'm coming to the end, folks. So please don't worry. Um, <laughs> Walter also said, my brother said, that my mother would come home from sometimes after having played, particularly with Dick Kerr's, and she would be fairly riled, and I think there's a rumour that Dick Kerr's women used to cast doubt on whether working for a brewery and brewing beer and bottling beer was as vital as an ammunition factory. Don't forget Dick Kerr's was an ammunition factory where, I mean, it was the most vital, one of the most vital jobs during the war effort. And I suppose bottling beer didn't come anywhere near that in terms of status. Um, <laughs> well, it is, yeah, it depends how you look on life. Yeah. Yeah. Another vague memory, well, another very clear memory is that my mother, um, these, these, are, these are random thoughts really. Uh, my mother walking with me on Heaton Hill, in Heaton there, wanting to play cricket with the boys and the boys rather than suffer the humiliation of being beaten by Mary May, which she, as, she was, as she was called then, just refused to allow her to play. And that happened two or three times. And it also pervaded my life. I started playing football at school and on Heaton Hill, but I'd be taunted by the the, 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 the call, you're not as good as your mother, you're not as good as your mother. <laughs> So I, I quietly abandoned football. <laughs> and um, took a bit of a rugby and then started to run a bit and, and ran ever since. 
But the, those, the cat calls, you're not as good as your mother, became a, a chance at St. Barnabas School, <laughs> maybe. Um, football was my mother's um, passion. Um, she was a regular attendant at Valley Parade. She used to drag myself and my sister to matches quite regularly. And that planted the usual seed of a, a love for Bradford City. Um, my dad was never bothered as much about that. But, um, my, my mother had a lifelong love for, the, for, the, for Bradford City. And Bradford isn't the most beautiful city in the world nowadays, but a strong emotional tie with the team is one of the glues, I think, that draw, glue, binds the city together. The passion for a marvellous, marvellous team. My final comment, folks, is nothing to do with football, and it's to people who are here who might have a mother or father or an ageing relative, um, and they haven't really talked to them about their life. One of my abiding regrets is not talking to my dad about Dunkirk and the war, and my mother more about her football prowess and her cricket prowess and her hockey prowess for this, these ladies. And I do regret just not talking and airing those views. So anybody around here young enough to have a, a living mother or father, let me implore you to um, get back home and start pummeling your questions, because you won't, you won't regret it one little bit. Thank you. Sorry guys, just one last thing, also just important, I've just forgotten to mention it early, just going back to the ladies football team, were the two trainers actually, Mr and Mrs Moffat, which were absolutely, you know, sort of crucial to this story. I know they were with the girls, you know, throughout their footballing career. Um, I know that they both did work at Listers. I have got lots of information, unfortunately I just ran out of time to dig it out. We know that David sadly was injured and shot in World War I, um, came to um, run the football team with his wife and I know later they were running a pub in, in Bradford later on in life but unfortunately they're just the name of the pub has just, um, I've just forgotten but basically important to mention those two and those two are in most of the Hayes team pictures. Um, uh, thank you uh, uh, Malcolm, that was really, really moving uh, and uh, I would completely echo what Malcolm said about talking to your older relatives uh, and you know, uh, <laughs> To, to find my granny had this incredible life, but, um, you know, um, been on this beautiful journey, and, and to meet Malcolm. Um, as you see, Malcolm there has got the photograph uh, that he sent to her uh, of, of the, the cricket team, the Hayes cricket team, which were, uh, was very divided. One little thing I did want to mention about Malcolm, what a beautiful man he is, is um, in the envelope that he sent to Catherine just over a year ago, wasn't it? There was a, a, a match programme. I have probably the world's greatest collection of women's football memorabilia in private hands. So I've got a hundred years of match programmes. Up until last year, I've never had one that had my granny's name in it. Um, and uh, in there was a, a Stoke v. Uh, Dick Kerr Ladies 1923 football programme that Malcolm had just given to Catherine and this is the friendship thing. Catherine gave that programme to me, extremely valuable, but the, the key thing for me, it's the only one in my collection that has my granny's name in it, very very rare and, and, and a beautiful, beautiful man. Beautiful man. Right. Come on. <laughs> big, big soft idiot at home. Um, so uh, we, we like to uh, uh, introduce the uh, uh, star um, uh, speaker today, uh, back again, uh, Mr. David Pendleton. Catherine and I, just one second, Catherine and I was finishing off these slides frantically yesterday at Catherine's home in Bailden, and I actually, mucking around with British newspaper archive, found this this little slide, and so we've dropped this in on Dave with absolutely no preparation, so I will hand over. Thank you, so In the 1930s, of course, women's football had been banned. A lot of them turned to cricket. 
1926 is uh, the first game featuring Hairs Ladies. It's not an official game, I think it's a knockabout game. It's probably the girls decided to do something this summer to keep the camaraderie going. But if they are a 1926 team, that makes them one of the first work working class women's cricket teams anywhere. But what happens in Bradford in 1930, the, uh, she's a remarkable woman actually, um, Hannah Drake, she's a, council a conservative councillor for Lidget Green. She's one of only two women councillors on Bradford Council. And her husband is the president of um, Lidget Green Cricket <coughs> Club. She watches an awful lot of women watching uh, Bradford, League, Bradford men's cricket league games in the 1920s and thinks, well, why don't we, why don't we try and make something of this? So she launches a knockout competition in 1930 at Lidget Green. And there's a fabulous, I've never seen this photograph until today, actually. Fabulous photograph of Lidget Green Women's Cricket Club in 1930. They do a knockout league and then they do an actual league from 1931 onwards and guess who joins in? Is of course. So it's a fabulous photograph. There are several others that have just come to light as well. If you go to the next one, Steve. This one is Bowling Dye Works. What's really remarkable about this is the age of the girls. They are very young, very young indeed. And I'm pretty certain that that's Bowling Old Lane Cricket Ground. So we'll have to nip up there, um, on the, I'll probably do a bus store there or something like that next, uh, in the next year or two. They've got the same white wall. All cricket grounds have white walls, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> in 1931, the Women's Even Cricket League in Bradford has 16 teams with 200 players. So it's an awful lot of players. By 1932, it's three divisions and 23 teams. Uh, we talked a lot about the influence of Hayes ladies. Margaret Whelan, who played in the football team and the cricket team, she becomes the league secretary. She's very well placed for this because she's the supervisor of the bottling plant at Hayes and then she becomes the company's secretary as well. So she's really, really well placed for that. However, Mary Tet though, sorry, I'm missing, I'm missing my name. I've had two pints before I started. So she becomes the league president as well. So I'm sorry, the league uh, secretary. But there is opposition and the Bradford Men's Cricket League head begins to talk about the women's game as being a pantomime. It describes the attire as only suitable for men. It said it's a spurious imitation of the genuine article. So this is 10 years after the, uh, the women's football has been, has been uh, abolished. Is that there's basically the, exactly the same prejudices from the men um, what, 10 years later in cricket. But by 1933, there's four divisions of women's cricket in Bradford. But it does begin to, it begins to recede. By the 1930s, it gets back to one league. And what's really interesting is it tends to be a, it tends to be mainly workplace provision. Once again, this, if people came to talk about baseball, I talked about the, the idea that baseball got pushed back on against with cricket. And they found a new home playing in workplace provision. And the, the, most of these big workplaces in Bradford, places like Lister's Mill, places like English Electric, 50% of the workforce will be women. And places like um, Manning and Mills, they had lacrosse teams, they had hockey teams, they had a football team, of course. They, they naturally were of a cricket team. And they would not face the same cultural hurdles that perhaps if you wanted to try and create a women's football, uh, sorry, women's cricket team at a Bradford Cricket League ground. Some, interestingly, some Bradford Cricket League teams definitely did support women's cricket. Lidget Green and Great Hawk have been, been really good examples of that. So it wasn't across the board, it seems, it seems to have been a, 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 from the top downwards. But of course, the war comes along, and then I think the hiatus of the war kind of, it, you know, the men returning to, to the, 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 the sort of, what somebody might want to call the natural order, if you like, sort of reasserts itself. And women's sport takes a put, it gets pushed backwards. But there's also, the, there's an awful lot of other things going on in society, so it's a difficult time to, to re-establish sports once you get to this side of the Second World War. And a lot of the girls, as well as they get older, you know, they, go, they, they have families, they get married, they probably haven't got time to play cricket. So, so it seems to be that it drifts away after the war. And everybody's six years older. So it's time to re-establish that. It's a great story. Malcolm actually uh, stole my thunder um, talking about his mum uh, up on up on Heaton uh, Hill there playing cricket. Wants to bowl at the lads and when she's in the forties and the lads are not having it because who wants to be bowled out by somebody's mother? Uh, it'd be terrible, wouldn't it? Uh, but anyway, there we are. So that's a very brief um, introduction to him. script. I'll pass it back to Steve.
Right, we, we're, we're just uh, coming, coming to the end now. I'll just point out very briefly that this was the article that I found yesterday. This is uh, Mary Tetlow. And uh, I had to explain this to my friend Catherine because she's not a cricketer. But where it says scorer, uh, there, it doesn't mean she was scoring. It means she was actually doing the score at the cricket game. So she was a very respected administrator at that point. And this is in 1937. The Australian national women's cricket team were doing a, a tour playing tests. And they played at Headingley against uh, the Yorkshire team. And you just look how many Bradford names are in there. So that would have come. From, from the league, and Mary Tetlow, this is Mary Tetlow, um, that, that, uh, uh, that was why they were so good, because they, they, you know, they, they had the league, so they formed the basis of the Yorkshire team. Um, I've got a few bits and bobs here, please do, uh, I'm gonna pack them away in 10 minutes, um, but um, I've got an actual shell that they used to, munition nets used to uh, fill, uh, very dangerously, occasionally they blow up in their faces. Um, it's got um, flowers etched on it. They're done by a hammer and a nail by the men after the war. Um, quite a macabre thing, quite heavy. And you just think about who would want to send this through somebody else's body. You know, it's sick, isn't it? So I, I don't. I used to have it on the shelf at home, but it, it, it sends shivers down my spine. So I, just, I keep it in, in in a box now. But um, you, you've got uh, flowers, and it's it's sort of like growing out of death. Um, so. Uh, uh, Please feel free to, to have a look and touch and feel. I've got some of the old footballs. Quite quite hard. Bladder. Men's football boots. Women were tiny back in the day. Women's football boots. These haven't been worn. They are genuine. Don't know how old they are. 50, 60, 70, 80 years. Never seen these before. Either child's boots or, or a small, small woman, probably. Um, some of the actual nailing studs made of uh, compressed leather, three, three, so I think they're offcuts of leather, they uh, uh, no health and safety those days. Um, and uh, this rattle, I, I, I'm, actually I will do it. Okay, so I got this off eBay for next to nothing a few years ago, and it was clattered in yellow paint, and I had it on top of my wardrobe. And I was almost to the point where I'm going to chuck it because it's horrible. So uh, I, I've watched all those programs, so I, I covered it in oven cleaner and left it in the garden for the day and then took a wire brush to it and it's come up with a beautiful patina and you can see that it had some white paint on it as well. Um, but actually, uh, if you look carefully, there's some initials, uh, some writing uh, being stenciled in and it's RCD 1944. So I actually think this is an air raid one from World War II because it looks industrial, like a bunch of them have been made. And then, of course, it will be used in the game. And if we were in 1945, all of us in here going on to Valley Parade, every one of us would have one of these, and you'd sort of see your mate at the end of the street, wouldn't you? Of course, um, I'm not going to try and take it in Valley Parade. It's <laughs> I'll, I'll get in trouble. Um, but feel free to come up and uh, have a look and a, a feel and touch of these, uh, 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 this stuff. Um, So, I just wanted to say that, you know, you've seen the picture of this stunning young woman, this athlete that was my granny. This is how I actually remember her. That's a genuine photo of her. That's her um, grizzled old lady, no teeth, uh, a, uh, a cardigan held together by uh, a safety pin. So, when I, I found out uh, the, 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 these glamorous pictures of this magnificent young woman, uh, it, it took a bit... For my head to deal with it because that you know that was my granny and we've made a little 12 minute film i don't know if we're going to be able to show it today but all you have to do is google lizzie ashcroft and you'll find the link and you can watch the 12 minute short film and there's a one minute trailer um we uh again very very lucky um the uh the scottish team that i showed earlier brother glenn the one of the star players for that is sadie smith i've done a Bit of research about her. Her granddaughter is Eddie Reader of Fairground Attraction fame. You know, it's got to be perfect. Sorry, I can't do that. Um, she donated one of the tracks, uh, um, uh, uh, Dragonflies, for our film for free as a sort of gift to me, which is lovely. And uh, the uncle of the director was John Anderson. Uh, so, uh, um, 
one of the last acts that Vangelis did before he passed away, John and Vangelis, was to give us a royalty-free copyright use of one of their tracks. So it's got, it's got some pretty good stuff on. This is all the theme that we've been talking about today. It's the friendship of football and the journey that has brought us all here today to meet and, and, and share these magnificent stories. So um, I think that's about all I want to say. Do you want to finish off? Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Malcolm, um, for a great introduction. We'll be back in March uh, for another talk about how football clubs find and keep their culture when they move grounds. That'd be fabulous. But once again, thank you, Malcolm, Catherine, and Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't believe